um, our final panelist uh, was sort of able to be here today. Um, Doc, rabbi Dr. Reich Weiss serves as the rabbi of Shar Shalom Congregation in Halifax and is also passionate about social justice. So, um, you're going to read Teresa. <laughs> Teresa will read uh, so Rabbi Weish's uh, um, presentation. And I'll use my best teacher voice. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, Rabbi Dr. Reish Weiss's presentation. Um, I'm just going to read through it, and please pardon me if I miss... Uh, pronounce certain uh, Hebrew words because do you want me to come here? Yes. All right. So, um, I'm going to send you. Mm -hmm. uh, mother, prophet, warrior, housewife, merchant, feminist, activist, teacher, rabbi. These greatly varied roles are but a sampling of the different roles Jewish women have inhabited across the millennia and countries in which Jews have lived. Just as the face of Judaism itself continues to change and evolve, so too the role of its female adherents has enjoyed a diverse spread of identities and meanings across time and space. Gender roles and expectations continue to play a decisive role in delineating between modern day Jewish denominations. This talk will provide an overview of some of these ongoing denominational debates and distinctions based mainly in different understandings of gender roles with an eye to these diverse ideologically driven positions, historical and sociological underpinnings. A superficial scan of the Bible might leave the modern reader with the impression that women in scriptures are uniformly relegated to the roles of mother, wife, and sometimes daughter. Namely, one might walk away with the impression that women are always framed by their relations to notable men living in the shadow of their male counterparts. From Eve to the many chains of almost strictly male begots, which is lines of genealogy, in Genesis, to Sarah, through all the matriarchs, down to Yochered, Miriam, Sephora, and later characters, including such female figures as Deborah, Abigail, Bathsheba, and Tamar, the Bible may seem to portray these women as suggestible, proud, jealous, and or petty. While this impression is not necessarily far off, it's a, in, in many respects, such as reading undermines the radical nature of the Torah and its understanding of women. The Torah pushed its original readers far beyond the legal expectations of their day especially as regards the role and responsibilities to slash of women. For example, as we learn in the case of the five daughters of Zelophshad, who approached Moses after their father had died, women, according to even the most ancient Jewish law, are entitled to inherit property. In Deuteronomy, in the laws concerning female war captives, the Torah reminds the male captors to respect the humanity of the captured women and allow them time and space to mourn their families from whom they were seized. While legal measures and protections such as these might strike the modern year as incredibly basic, if not downright insufficient rights, we must remind ourselves of the highly gendered and patriarchic context in which they were first revealed. It is also important to remember that nearly all men in the Torah likewise exist in relation to other kinsfolk and that their behavior is also scrutinized, sometimes also along more gendered lines. Virtually every father in the Bible is a deeply flawed father. What is so striking about the language of the Torah is that it is so intriguingly sparse when it comes to emotional, physiological detail. The Torah favors action verbs over lengthy descriptions of characters' uh, in inferiority, I think. These gaps invite the reader in to decode for her himself what these eclipses mean and perhaps to insert her slash himself in the narrative and update the stories and messages for his, her own times. The rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic 
commentators took it upon themselves to try to fill in these narrative and psychological gaps in the Torah, offering spiritually meaningful homilies aimed at helping readers improve their actions and character, and ultimately helping them try to unlock the larger meaning of the biblical stories. Such rabbinic commentaries also reveal a wealth of information historically and culturally about the role of women in their times. In these readings, we learn via the rabbis about everything from aesthetic preferences to ritual practices of the women of their times. From the sages of second century Palestine to the rabbis of sixth century Babylonia, to the purveyors of tradition in 9th century Tunisia, to the early medieval rabbis of Spain and France, to the early modern Kabbalists, mystics of Iraq, through the rabbis of 19th century Hungary, the rabbinic chain of tradition includes many different links, each offering its own unique angle on Jewish belief and practice, including that which pertains to women's role and status in Judaism. Given their times and cultural milieus, it should come of no surprise that these rabbinic authors were more, almost exclusively men. That said, even the Talmud, Judaism's crowning legal achievement, which includes a detailed compendium of rabbinically derived laws, including both the prevailing views as well as the dissenting views, includes occasional female voices. One such important figure is Beruha, who was both the daughter of the esteemed rabbi Chinanaya and the wife of another uh, revered Talmudic scholar, Rabbi Mir. Beruha was reputed to have studied formidable amounts of legal texts each day and possessed an encyclopedic knowledge of the traditional text. She was also wise and compassionate and would share her insights with her husband, Rabbi Meir. Once, for example, when Rabbi Meir was growing frustrated with the loud, wild reveries of their neighbors, excuse me, uh, while he was trying to study, he prayed to God, he prayed that God would do away with their neighbors. Berua rejoined with her characteristic piety, reminding her husband of the words of the Psalms, asking God to do away with evil, not evil doers. In general, the rabbinic expectations of Jewish women from a ritual standpoint are rather limited. Whereas traditional rabbinic Judaism understands all Jewish men to be obligated to perform all 613 commandments, it exempts women from any time-bound commitments as adult women were traditionally assuming the role of full-time stay-at-home mothers. As such, women remain largely absent from both the traditional processes of ritual deliberation, production, and participation in traditional Judaism, save home rituals such as lighting candles for Sabbaths and holidays and baking traditional ala bread. Even in more recent modern Jewish communities, such as in Eastern Europe, right before the war, many women remained even illiterate in Hebrew. Instead of praying from the regular prayer book, many of these women prayed instead, from, instead from a compilation intended for women of devotional prayers and homilies in Yiddish. The division of gender roles in Judaism has often closely mirrored those of Jewish communities, host cultures. The last couple centuries, especially in the West, have introduced massive unprecedented change as how Jewish women understand themselves, both religiously and culturally. The dramatic change in women's status in different streams of Judaism is due in large part to the constantly expanding culture of increased professional and personal opportunities and rights for women. One sees these changes, especially in countries such as the United States, where there exist at least four main distinct denominations of Judaism each with defined centers of learning, each grappling in its own way with such issues as the ordination of women. 
The first Jewish denomination to ordain women as rabbis was the Reform Movement, a group which grew out of post-Enlightenment Germany, which advocated for the uh, synthesis of modern Western values and a commitment to traditional Jewish ethics. The Reconstructionist and Conservative movements eventually followed suit, each with their own distinct processes of deliberation. Such, uh, just a couple of years ago, the conservative movement celebrated its 30th year of ordaining women. And I'm proud to be among those women ordained, not me, proud to be among the women ordained. <laughs> Today, a branch of left-leaning Orthodox Jews are trying hard to recognize a small but growing group of women steeping themselves in the traditional uh, legal sources as leaders with rabbinic qualities and responsibilities within their communities. These women and those who support and recognize their leadership are still experiencing a great deal of resistance within the mainstream orthodox world which has come to define itself in many respects along gender lines. For example, as a conservative rabbi, my own religious observance is nearly identical to those of my orthodox counterparts. The only significant difference is that if you walk into almost any conservative movement synagogue, adult women will be counted in a ritual quorum and allowed to sing and lead prayer, while in an orthodox community, women sit behind a ritual wall, dividing the men and women, are not counted as part of a quorum, and are not allowed to lead services. Differences in approach to gender and ritual expectations are the basis of many rifts within, sorry, within Judaism today. One example is the ongoing struggle between a group in Israel called the Women of the Wall and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel. Women of the Wall are a group of highly educated Jewish feminists who assemble monthly in the designated women's section of the Western Wall in Jerusalem to pray and chant from the Torah together. These women often don traditional prayer shawls, ritual garb traditionally reserved for Jewish men outside such progressive denominations such as Reform and Conservative Judaism. The chief of rabbinate of Israel has repeatedly tried to thwart women of the wall's efforts to pray together at the Western Wall, but the group perseveres. While gender continues to play an especially important role and visible in, a visible role in Jewish communities, such as those in Israel, ritual and social activity in Jewish communities worldwide are slowly becoming increasingly less gender. Even social activity in synagogues used to be far more gendered. Whereas the post-war era saw rise to booming sisterhoods and men's clubs in synagogues across North America, today such groups are in steady decline, at least within the progressive streams of Judaism, in large part due to the high volume of young women entering the workforce and, uh, and, make, and finding attachments to fixed notions of gender as the primary access along which one's identity centers. Even in orthodox communities, both women and men are assuming roles of social leadership, such as serving on their synagogue's board of trustees, and orthodox young women are furthering their Jewish literacy in intellectually and spiritually meaningful ways, just as their male peers do. Since my ordination, people often refer to me as women rabbi. I have not heard any of my male colleagues referred to as man rabbi. <laughs> the implication of calling me a woman rabbi is to suggest there is something exotic. <laughs> okay, I have light. <laughs> there is something exotic about my compound identity as both a woman and as a rabbi. Just as one would not refer to their general practitioner who happens to be female, as their female doctor, or their attorney, <laughs> or their attorney who happens to be female as their lawyer lady, 
It is my hope, prayer, and belief that soon one day, everyone can easily refer to me as simply Rabbi. We are first and foremost souls, and the rest is artifice. I don't think I've said so many big words in one go in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Teresa, and also to the rabbi for...